Howdy! Let's look at the worst oh. cartoons, but what if we made them not the worst? Because my friend, we're gonna rebuild them, or at least try. But if they're beyond repair, which is entirely possible, maybe we can at least nudge them from a 0 out of 10 to a 1 out of 10. It's the small wins, you know. Let's try fixing the worst cartoon episodes. And if you're in a hurry, I've included timestamps below. Hopefully I've got one or two of your favourites. Anyway, let's begin. Now oh, this will be fun, I like wearing a stupid hat. One Course Meal Well, this is the most notorious Spongebob episode of all time. Ah, shall I help out then? Yeah, we'll handle this together. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I can say that. Where's that damn fourth Chaos Emerald? <laughs> the story itself is pretty straightforward. Plankton is harassed by crabs, disguised as a whale to the point of a complete mental breakdown. Alright, let's get straight to repairing. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Krabs is banned from this episode. I say have the citizens chase him out of town for the whole thing. But in response, Pearl has to watch over her dad's business. Otherwise, she doesn't get her allowance. You could say Pearl is the boss. That's right. <laughs> it's me. We can watch TV and eat cheese! Anyway, Plankton arrives to try and get the formula but he's terrified and scared off once he sees Pearl. But obviously, once Plankton's scared off, the harassment ends. No stalking him, no driving him to insanity. But Pearl would never continually harass Plankton anyway. The only person who would stalk him has been chased out of town and his daughter is running the business. And we know Pearl wouldn't hurt a fly. And this gives us a platform to discuss fear exposure to the audience. If Plankton ever wants that secret formula, this forces him to expose himself to his fears. In this case, the species that killed his ancestors, the whales. Maybe we could have a quick montage of Plankton looking over movies of whales. Maybe then meeting whales at a meet and greet. Then finally, he confronts Pearl at the Krusty Krab. Maybe he creates a giant robotic whale that tries to scare Pearl back. We've certainly seen before that Plankton can make robots, he's literally married to a robot. Personally, I think this story would be a bit more fun than the current one course meal we have. We get to see Pearl as the boss and Krabs is banished from the episode. Plus Pearl and Plankton face off at the end. What do you think? Number 13. Wonky Whistle Ah, Thomas, I knew we'd meet again soon. And honestly, I am royally sick of this episode. But some viewers did request I try and look at this one, so let's try and fix this train wreck once and for all. Now, as much as I completely understand the narrator, Michael Angelus, expressing zero interest in his performance here. On the way, Thomas saw Bertie the bus at the level crossing. Let's try doubling his pay for this episode. So maybe he can sound a bit less reluctant. Maybe he could sound more like this. Ferdinand's pistons pumped with pride. Gordon's pride was in pieces. And because it peeves me off, let's remove the helium from Thomas's voice and make his face look less weird and balloony. Perhaps more like the modern seasons of the show or the recent movies. Next, we can make Thomas stay the extra nine seconds required for his whistle to be fixed and not accelerate his engine out of the station while two workers are still on top of him. And when two people scream for him to stop, he could actually stop. The only problem being is if he actually listens to people, we lose the main conflict of the episode. Like, if he stays the extra two seconds required to let the farmers close the door, then the barn animals don't escape. So maybe we give him some more unpredictable animals. Instead of transporting a cow, Thomas could transport an angry bull and an elephant. Those would be far more interesting to see at a fair than a cow. But halfway there, Thomas has to stop suddenly. This gets the bull angry as it collides with the elephant. They get in a fight, break down the door and escape. The whole county fair is threatened to be cancelled as wild animals stampede towards it. So Thomas and his friends have to corner the animals while the zookeeper arrives. This way, Thomas doesn't have to look and act like a complete out-of-character loon. And we can even bring his friends to help save the day. Maybe the lesson to the kids here can be, sometimes you can't stop bad things happening. In other words, shit happens. Well, yeah, pretty much. Number 12. Lisa Goes Gaga. This could be tough, but not impossible, because I don't mind Lady Gaga, and I think she could work in a Simpsons episode. I really appreciate all the good she's done in the world and the way she's inspired a lot of people, particularly in the LGBTQI community. 
So let's dial back her personality and the bombastic stupidity of this episode by 11. Let's instead have Lady Geiger appear unexpectedly. Perhaps she's washed up and tired of music and secretly crashing in the Simpsons attic. Then maybe one of the Simpsons could find her and say, Oh, that lady in the music videos is in our attic. Then Lady Gag could say, I'm tired of the hustle of the music business. I want to do something else with my life. Maybe they have to help her find another career she likes. I think it'd be funny having Lady Gaiga counter work at the Quickie Mart. Hell, maybe she loves working at the Quickie Mart and then she says, The Quickie Mart is my true calling. I must sing a song about convenience stores. That way if they do decide to replace our poo, maybe Lady Golfer could occasionally drop in to voice herself as the new Quickie Mart attendant. Oh, maybe she could work in the bowling alley alongside Barney. Maybe she could dance up the place when the bowling lights go out. Barney could be her backup dancer. What do you mean the bank is out of money? But at the end of the episode, she finally says, The music stays in my heart wherever I go. I'm going to write songs again, mostly about convenience stores. Goodbye forever, Springfield. See, isn't it more fun when we take the ego trip out of the episode? And we stopped Lady Gag being this out of place role model to Lisa. What was that about? I never got how Lady Gaga would be a role model to the rational academic of the series. Instead, we've made her a more organic part of The Simpsons world. And for Jeebus sake, if you want a role model for Lisa, bring an academic on. No, not Lady Gander and certainly not Elon Musk. The... I'll go get some more bricks. Maybe bring Mary Curie forward in time. Have her meet Einstein. Perhaps together they topple Burns' nuclear power plant. I think Simpsons episodes can work with Lady Gacha in them. Just write her a story that doesn't sound like a hyperactive fanfic written by a 12 year old child. We've started here before. Number 11. The Amazing World of Gumball. The Girlfriend. Personally, I'm a big fan of The Gumball Show. Just recently, Nin and I rewatched a lot of the series. But we both agreed that they really, really botched up this episode. Looking back at this Gumball episode, it's just weird with some outright strange, mixed up, nasty messages. Dude, for the sake of everyone's safety, can you please talk to her and put an end to this? Mm -mm. The Girlfriend is notorious for being one of the worst Gumball episodes of all time. And five years ago, I agreed so much that I ranked it as the worst Gumball episode of all time in my video. As a refresher, it's about Darwin being trapped in a relationship with Jamie. Basically, the one-note bully of the school with no depth. She's kind of boring. Not in the mood for banana. Darwin seems to feel trapped because he doesn't have feelings for Jamie, and Jamie creates a very toxic, dangerous relationship. If you ignore me or break up with me, there will be serious consequences. In I still think this could be an interesting commentary. But the bigger problem is Darwin's advice of doing nothing when in a relationship where violence is happening. Her problem is that she doesn't understand love. So the best thing to do is to wait quietly until she works it out for herself. I think with terrible advice like this, the episode is pretty dead from the start. But let's see if we can aim for going from that 0 out of 10 to maybe a 2 out of 10. That seems realistic. I think the first core problem we have to the girlfriend is it's just not very pleasant to watch. Most of the time, Jamie's just in an uncontrolled reign of terror hurting her classmates or pushing Darwin around, even chasing Gumball down horror film style at the end. Ugh. So say we absolutely have to keep the girlfriend model. What if instead of Darwin dating Jamie, he instead dates Tina Rex? Gumball. Stop running. Gumball. For one, Tina is hilarious. And for two, we saw in the seventh episode, The Quest, that Tina has a sensitive, more complex side. I'm sorry. It's just that I've never had a toy before. She helped me to sleep. Though she is still a bit of a bully. So I think she'd make a much more interesting replacement for Jamie. So here's our new story for the girlfriend. Tina Rex has a secret crush on Darwin and gets up the courage one day to ask him out. And Darwin says, yes, let's date. And before you think Darwin would never go out with Tina, remember he went out with Gumball in a dress. Now, if we want this to be anything beyond a zero out of 10, we have to toss out the don't tell her you don't love her and say nothing crap. 
It remains one of the most botched messages in the history of animation. I would find it funny if Darwin fell in mutual love with Tina. And we just saw everyone's astounded reactions to these two becoming an item. Maybe we could finish the episode on the two having a teary reunion. Maybe Tina destroys the cafeteria running over to Darwin. So instead of the girlfriend having a terrible message about being silent in relationships, maybe encourage the kids to not give up on finding that right person. Whether you're an orange blob or a T-Rex, what matters is that person treats you with love and respect. Number 10. Stewie is on Shantae. How? How do you fix an episode where Stewie gets pregnant? Where a baby creates another baby with a dog? Brian, we're pregnant! Oh my god! I thought over this for a long time. What could make this episode even kinda sorta work? Well, I think there's a grain of an idea in Brian and Stewie being forced to raise a child together because they've made such a great duo on so many adventures. And surely raising a family would be an interesting adventure for two friends. I'm not saying it'd be an easy adventure, just an interesting one. Oh, Dick really likes you. I like Dick. Aha, you like Dick! So what if Stewie's son came back in time from the future through Stewie's time machine? Maybe Stewie's son is constantly trying to kill his father, just like Stewie was trying to kill his mother for the first few seasons of the show. Maybe the two need to save future Stewie from being killed by his son. You could even do like a meta joke where Stewie says, Ugh, why would you do that, kid? Killing your parent is so cliche, pointless, and stupid. I wouldn't keep doing that for more than two seasons. <laughs> or let's make it even simpler. Maybe the two are forced into a situation where they adopt a son or daughter together. Take out all the creepy pregnant stuff and just give the kid two quirky dads. That's it. They don't need to neglect them. They don't need to be abominations. What would be a real twist is if Brian and Stewie turned out to be really good parents. You could even use it to talk about some of the issues of adoption. See, I don't know anything about adoption life because it's almost never talked about in any show I've ever seen. But given more millennials and Gen Zs are choosing to be child-free than ever before, maybe a little info on adoption would be handy. It, it's got to be a more fun idea than whatever that was we ended up with. Move that building, boys. It's number nine. Caillou joins the circus. Today's story is called Caillou Joins the Circus. And I hope you enjoyed those first three seconds of the episode, as those three seconds are all the circus we will be seeing here. As far as Caillou goes, this is among the most notorious episodes, if not the, mainly because of Caillou's bratty outbursts and whiny behavior. So let's get to fixing, or at least making safe enough to not collapse under its own weight. So I'm gonna blow your mind here. What if in the episode Caillou joins the circus, Caillou actually joins the circus? I know, right? So we can see at this part here that Caillou knows what juggling is. You can be in the circus, Daddy. You're a good juggler. So rather than him making animal-shaped toast at home, maybe Caillou can actually learn to juggle. And then he can start street performing. The circus spots his uh, talent, and they figure it'd be a lark if he performs on their show. Caillou practices juggling every day, and soon he's ready for his circus performance. Boom, we see him performing next to the lion tamer. No tantrums, no awkward carrying on. Then we can end the episode and put ourselves out of our slightly less misery. But I should mention, nowadays I personally think the new show is way better. It even has an episode where Caillou helps a kid in his class on the spectrum. A fire alarm goes off and it's really interesting and relatable and they handle the subject really well. Plus Eggman now voices Caillou's dad, which is awesome. Mike Pollock is awesome in anything he does. Moving on. Back to work, boys. Number eight, SpongeBob stuck in the ringer. This was among the most requested episodes for me to discuss. Very quick refresher, SpongeBob gets stuck in a drying device. That's it. And we get what you might call a SpongeBob torture episode, where SpongeBob can't do anything for himself but sit in misery. I can't even eat ice cream now! <gasps> Riggers in the way! Patrick's a horrible friend and the town treats him like garbage. Big surprise. So I actually already tried fixing this one in a member video. What I found is in any other season, this ringer would be a four to five second joke. SpongeBob would get stuck in it and get himself out in a funny creative way and we'd move on. But since this is a season seven episode, everything is dragged out relentlessly. 
so if we have to make Spongebob getting stuck in this ringer the main plot of the episode, how about instead of making the stupid decision and going to his friend Patrick, he goes to his other best friend, the scientist Sandy. I know I default to Sandy a lot, but it, it makes sense here. Sandy can be like, Don't worry, SpongeBob. I'll get you out of there. Then we could get a whole bunch of creative ways Sandy uses crazy inventions to try and get her friend out. This means we can dump all the SpongeBob torture. None of him failing to eat ice cream. None of him failing to cook with no hands. None of him being chewed out by the townspeople. And we don't need him being isolated at home. He can just go over to the tree dome to see Sandy and the fun starts. The community had some good suggestions how to fix this episode as well, such as Ice Queen. Have the blue fiasco be an accident and Patrick works to find the solvent for the blue. Include Sandy in the episode and remove the jerky bikini bottomites. Tunkon mostly wanted the ending changed. After SpongeBob snaps at Patrick, the town does not become a dick to SpongeBob. Instead, Patrick cries, but then soon comes to apologize to SpongeBob and removes him from the ringer. I agree. I think all of these would be way more likable versions of Stuck in the Ringer. That would be hilarious. Oh, oh that's stuck. Oh, that's worse. <laughs> and it's seven lucky seven. The Splinter. You might have already heard of this notorious episode. SpongeBob gets a big nasty splinter stuck in his thumb. And then we see the grotesque pus-filled results as he goes to Patrick to try and get it out. Yes, this is season six SpongeBob, so he has no common sense. I mean, there's a couple of funny jokes here. <gasps> this thing is stuck pretty good. Like when SpongeBob pulls out the buns and they're between his buns. Buns, check. And I love this minor detail from Squidward when he leaves this note to Spongebob. He leaves a heart for Spongebob in his notes. How cute is that? Oh, love you too, Squiddy. But then, of course, the episode goes southward when Spongebob gets his grotesque splinter. He injures himself while dodging a bunch of swords. Now, if we have to go the injury route, suppose he was instead cut up by the swords. And since he's Spongebob, we instead get two halves of Spongebob working together to fry up patties. Maybe they cause a ruckus and, I don't know, Krabs has to stick him back together. Or maybe Spongebob just finds himself with a crazy splitting headache during a busy shift. And he has to learn he's been overworking and needs a mental health break. It'd be an easy, fun way to talk about self-care with the kids, and they don't even have to see any splinters. Besides, if anyone should be familiar with the issue of overworking, it's Spongebob. So maybe instead of the splinter, Spongebob instead gets a headache while grilling, and suddenly he can't concentrate on working. And maybe he finally asks Sandy at the end, who says, Just take a break, Spongebob. He takes a break at the end, and eventually he's back to normal. Boom. Done. Yeah, I think it's about as decent as we're gonna get it. Okie dokie. Number six. Family Guy, Seahorse Seashell Party. Uh, full disclosure, nowadays I'm much more positive on new seasons of Family Guy. I watch it on Disney Plus and I get a lot of laughs out of the new seasons. There's still problems, but in my opinion, not nearly as many as there were in this Seahorse Seashell season. So I think there's two problems we need to fix in this episode. One, the message at the end is absolutely horrible. That this family can't survive without some sort of lightning rod to absorb all the dysfunction? And two, it's boring and almost nothing happens in it. So let's first fix problem one. Meg should still call out her family's bullcrap behavior to her, but rather than the terrible end message that she's got to take abuse so her family stays together, she can just leave. Just listen to what Meg says here. And honestly, when I turn 18, I don't know that I ever want to see you again. So Meg's 17 in this episode, let's just set Seahorse Seashell Party on her 18th birthday. Hey Meg, happy birthday. And let her say, Hey, this is stupid. I'm moving out. This actually fixes the second problem as well, of it being boring and nothing happening. Instead of a prolonged scene of Peter making dad noises, and instead of Meg having a 15 minute outburst, shorten it to a two to three minute outburst max. I think this outburst is still very important as it's very therapeutic for the viewer, but use the second half of the episode for Meg moving out. Well, that's it. I'm off to a new town to start a new life. Similar to Better Off Meg, hell, make it a permanent change in the series. Would you be bothered by Meg living somewhere else? Would that take away from the Family Guy experience for you? No, then why not? 
Meg could work at the bowling alley with Bruce while doing night school. And hey, they're friends, why not let her move in with Bruce and his boyfriend? They might be a fun trio. In case you've forgotten, Meg has an argument and a major fallout with Lois particularly. And if the show wants, Meg can eventually forgive Lois. But let her do it from a safe distance, a place where she feels safe. Also, I think Brian should stay on his, uh, trip. I think the most endearing part of this episode is seeing Stewie help Brian through this trip. It's gonna be okay. Your pal Stewie is right here. And some of the visuals during this trip, even if not all pleasant, are very memorable. If the story has to be set in that stagnant, rainy, indoor setting, we need that insanity to get us through the first half. So to summarize, Meg has a short but well-needed outburst on her 18th birthday on a rainy day. She moves out and we get a new permanent change in the series. If Maud Flanders can die in The Simpsons, then surely after 23 years, Meg can move out of home. Okay, number five, regular show. The best burger in the world. Until I see that every last one of your jobs is finished, then neither one of you is going near that burger truck. Oh, I hope to never be a boss this rude and horrible to my own teammates. This regular show episode got recommended so much, and at first watching it, I wondered what all the fuss was about. People said this gumballhead guy Benson is horrible in this episode, but at first he's just asking Mordecai and Rigby to finish their jobs because they're on the clock before going for burgers. I mean, that's strict, but I get everyone needs to do their job. But the sheer amount they're required to do is staggering. And Benson seems to be actively enjoying their suffering. Have fun, you two. <laughs> I don't believe this. And that is not excusable. But the point of no return for many is when Rigby and Mordecai finally order their burgers, Benson eats them. You guys were right all along. These burgers are outstanding. What a twonk. It's a bit like a Squidward torture episode, except it's Mordecai and Rigby torture. Basically, everyone's just munching on their burgers while Mordecai and Rigby helplessly watch. So let's try and get to fixing. I can fix it! We can still let Benson be strict, but he should be way less controlling and domineering over Mordecai and Rigby. He shouldn't be reminding me of all the worst bosses I've ever worked for. You know what I'd do if I was Mordecai and Rigby's boss? If they absolutely had to finish their work that very second, I'd be going up to that food truck and finding out their closing time. And I go and buy two burgers for them as soon as they're done working. It's clearly deeply important to them. Benson, please! You can't do this to us! I wish I could get that excited over a burger. Benson shouldn't just be punishing loafing, he should be rewarding hard work. And if it's only one per customer, I'd be putting on multiple disguises trying to get them to give me two burgers. So hear me out, instead of the final twist being Benson eats their burgers, why not make the twist that the burgers actually taste awful? They spend the whole stupid episode building up these burgers as incredible and one per customer and only being sold once every hundred years. The ultimatum is so amazing, it's only being offered once every 100 years. Which is the dumbest business model in the history of the universe. But what if the others are secretly hiding that these are terrible tasting burgers? Mordecai and Rigby can bite into their burgers finally and be like, Ugh, dude, these are terrible, and like throw them away. And maybe Muscle Man goes, We didn't want to dash your hope. Oops, you seem so happy. I'm certainly no regular show expert, but I think that'd give us a lot more laughs than what we got here. Yeah, number four. Hey Arnold, Arnold Betrays Iggy. This is an old 90s slice of life cartoon you might not be too familiar with, so I'll be brief. As a refresher, Arnold catches his friend Iggy in his bunny pajamas and reveals his secret to everyone in the schoolyard. You're pulling my leg, right? I didn't say anything. Therefore, Arnold has to do everything under the sun to win back Iggy's trust, eventually resulting in Arnold walking through the town in bunny pajamas. Because of this, he then hates Iggy in return, thus repeating this stupid cycle. I mean, realistically, nowadays, Iggy's secret would probably just get him invited to the Brony fan club. I'm feeling called out. The only difference being is that a lot of the people in the club wear pony costumes instead of bunny costumes. 
So let's pretend that bunny pajamas are embarrassing, at least to Iggy. How do we fix this? Well, let's make it something more interesting than just bunny pajamas. Like Iggy has a secret disco fever and Arnold tells everyone at school. At first, Iggy feels betrayed, but then he decides to own his secret and he plans a disco performance in the school talent show. Arnold feels bad about betraying Iggy, so to apologize for telling everyone, Arnold secretly learns disco as well. And together at the end, Arnold and Iggy dance disco in front of the school. I guess ballet would be a little more embarrassing? Well, they can dance ballet in front of the school then. The point being, this is a wonderful surprise for Iggy, and we get a fun ending with both Arnold and Iggy dancing it out. This also sends kids a message about acknowledging your hidden secrets and owning them. Boy. Because almost always, your greatest weakness is also your greatest strength. And for number three, Fairly Odd Parents. It's a wishful life. I'm definitely no expert on Fairly Odd Parents, but this is definitely one of the most hated episodes of the series. But why does this particular episode cause so much grief with a lot of adult cartoon watchers? My personal guess is a lot of us adult cartoon watchers are on the spectrum. And as someone on the spectrum myself, being told I was quote unquote useless or that no one needs me and it would have been better if I was never born, well, that hits me hard. And the story is basically that. Timmy goes to an alternative reality where he discovers that everyone's lives around him would have been better if he was never born. And that's basically it. So it's not only intellectually stagnant, but pretty boring. All right. So what could we do to fix it? Well, I would keep the alternative future. But instead of just everything being better, we give the kids and adults a bit of nuance. You know, play it realistic. If I went into an alternative future, I might discover that some people's lives are better without me, but I might also discover people who really could have used someone like me around. Even if it was something as simple as me giving them a smile when I deliver their pizza or as they pay for their fuel at the service station. Timmy could discover that his little actions, small ones he didn't notice, still had a positive effect on people. And while Timmy's caused a lot of mischief and problems, he's also inadvertently caused a lot of good too. And that's life, it just is. It's not all bad and it's not all good. It's chaos, but we try our best to cause a little more good than bad. Timmy, me, and you could deliver pizzas our whole lives and still cause a very positive impact on a whole lot of people. How you doing? Number two. Foster's home for imaginary friends. Everyone knows it's bendy. People universally hate this episode. Possibly because it has one of the worst cartoon tropes of all time. This trope is where someone continually does bad things and someone else is blamed for it. In this case, Bendy continually does bad things and Blue is blamed for it. There's a reason you almost never see this trope in modern cartoons nowadays. Because it's so frustrating for the audience to watch the injustice of it. Ironically though, Blue wasn't punished for this episode, but Bendy was deeply punished for this episode. Both Lauren Faust and Craig McCracken, the creators for Foster's Home for Imagine imaginary friends have stated this episode is non-canon and never happened. You might remember they created My Little Pony and Powerpuff Girls. In fact, they stated the character Bendy is non-canon and just never happened in the rest of the series. They're so ashamed of Bendy, both creators have openly admitted guilt and apologized for making this episode and stated they also hate this episode. Blue might have been punished in this one episode, but he remained the star of Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. While Bendy was shunned by his creators and literally wiped out of existence. So yeah, how do you fix it? Well, with this trope, the concept's pretty doomed from the start. But what if we reverse the situation? Bendy can keep setting up elaborate pranks and trying to blame Blue and his friends. But what if he keeps accidentally incriminating himself? See, I just chuckle thinking about that. That way we still get the elaborate pranks, but it's just and satisfying to the viewer. Canon-wise, Bendy never appears again, so I figure we have two choices here. By, say, the fifth failed prank, we could have him exiled from Foster's home permanently. Or if you want to be nice, he can open a prank shop like in Diagon Alley with Ronald Weasley's brothers. That way he can put his prank powers to good use. That's all I got. Bendy was seen as a stain on Cartoon Network's history that has been bleached clean by his creators. So Bendy might have had that one moment in the sun, but he was as thoroughly punished as humanly possible.
And before we get to number one, let's go through some honorable mentions. These are the episodes that might have been requested a lot, but I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out how to fix them. A Pal for Gary, the other worst SpongeBob episode. Gary's chased around by SpongeBob's new pet, and SpongeBob is horrible to Gary. So what could we do to fix this quickly without turning this into a top 15 list? Well, let's keep it simple. Make SpongeBob less oblivious. Apart from the obvious problem of SpongeBob's cruelty, it's just the same shtick repeated. Similar to Everyone Knows It's Bendy, these otherwise smart characters are suddenly looking at just the wrong time and have become oblivious and stupid. So why don't we let this evil pet loose in the Krusty Krab instead? Then SpongeBob, Squidward, Krabs, and Gary all have to work together to figure out how to stop it. Avatar The Last Airbender, The Great Divide. This episode also got requested a whole lot, but honestly, I have never known how to fix this one. I rewatched it, and just like seven years ago, it just left me neutral. You could possibly make adults fighting in a hundred year feud not talk like they're school kids taunting each other in a schoolyard argument, but then the message might not be as understandable to the teen demographic. Besides, it's not a good Avatar episode, but it's certainly not among the worst cartoon episodes of all time, by a long shot. Gumball, the worst. This was also requested a few times, so I rewatched it. But once again, I just wasn't sure what I could do to improve it. Watching it again, I laughed a bit. Though I did I definitely get why people don't like it, as it feels like it was written with a lot of anger. But in 10 minutes, the episode wants to portray the complaints and daily irritations of both adults, children, women, and men. And that is a really tall task for 10 minutes. I could nitpick, but I feel a lot of what they said are legitimate complaints. But I probably would have said them a bit nicer, and certainly differently. I found it interesting how they talk about how men can have difficulty asking for help from others. Because I can't think of another cartoon or show that ever really talks about that. And I've never forgotten what the term glass ceiling means after seeing this episode six years ago. So yeah, ironically nowadays I consider the worst Gumball episode just mediocre. Arthur, so funny I forgot to laugh. There's a lot of cartoons out there and a lot of people requested this one be fixed. But how would you change this episode without messing up the message? Arthur drags a stupid sheepdog joke out too much, which turns him into a bully to Sue Ellen. I guess it's a bit out of character for Arthur, but it's not out of character for him to be a pinhead. He's just a kid. I think the message is okay. Listen to the feedback of others to see if they're feeling uncomfortable. Sometimes even the nicest of people can miss it. I'm not saying the episode isn't a cringy watch, but I have no idea how you could keep the message and change it for the better at the same time. Anyway, with those said, on to number one. Hmm. I don't know, isn't this basically a snuff film? Should I handle this? Well, I think it takes a gentler touch too. Shall we review it together? Sounds good, works for me. Number one. Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon. Ren Seeks Help. Hmm. <laughs> Ah, we meet again. So how can we fix this thing? We're watching a cartoon episode dedicated to showing the formation of a psychopath and the drawn out torture of various animals. And then the gradual beating to death of Ren's psychologist. I still argue this is one of the first animated snuff films. So I think it's important to remind viewers with this part, people like this do exist. And tragically, people with these experiences absolutely exist. In fact, in popular psychology, the torture of animals is seen as one of the first signs of a psychopath. But I don't think we should necessarily run from this topic. We can address it, but I think we frame it very differently to how this episode did. We've already seen another character with a childhood like this. Bojack Horseman, of course. His father and mother were rotten to the core and made him suffer horribly as a child. Learning how this affected Bojack as an adult made for some of the most heartfelt, relatable, powerful animation I've ever seen. Ren can openly admit he had a traumatic childhood. That's fine, many people have had trauma in their childhoods. He can even discuss it in detail with a psychologist. But we don't necessarily need to see Stimpy bawling his eyes out. We don't need to see Ren chainsawing an animal while his parents make out. 
and we don't need to zoom in on the animals' faces while they're tortured. On a side note, I have no idea what stupid, overdone, evil Disney commentary Crick Falusi was trying to make by putting Ren in a Mickey Mouse hat, so let's just ignore that. And what does a psychologist say about all Ren's horrible memories? I think this part's important as it shows how Ren can digest all these traumatic childhood experiences. Rather than the psychologist turning on him, attacking him, and basically calling him a lost cause, let Ren express himself without judgement, whether his thoughts are good or evil. Based on my advanced counselling course in university, I'll tell you what I would probably say instead. In Freud's voice, because Freud is fun, maybe the horse psychologist can say, But Ren, you have made your first most important step on your journey to recovery. A step that many psychopathic people can never make. You felt remorse for hurting Stimpy, and you reached out for help. The key now is to be aware of when these feelings of anger form, so you can be in control. I'm so sorry if I've messed up this accent. I think it turned out to be slightly uh, Russian. A proper psychologist might teach Ren cognitive behavioral therapy, where he learns to identify and change his thoughts as they happen. It's literally in the title that Ren seeks help, and many psychopaths never do that because they think they're fine, because they don't feel remorse. That's part of what makes them psychopathic. So, to summarize our fixes, we still see Stimpy upset, and we still see Ren remorseful after hurting Stimpy, but we don't drag out Stimpy's wailing or Ren's walk to the psychologist. Ren can still show his traumatic childhood, but it should be much quicker and focused more on Ren than the animal's suffering. After all, this is about Ren seeking help, isn't it? And finally, you think it'd go without saying, but the psychologist doesn't need to try and beat Ren to death. And we don't need a prolonged scene of Ren killing the horse. Well, that's depressing. Instead, he can act like a real psychologist and maybe try and help Ren use some of the points I made before. And with that, congratulations. We have mended one of the worst cartoon episodes of all time. And we've turned it into something slightly better, maybe salvageable, better than it was. Let's go with that. And if you've got your own ways you'd fix these episodes, or you can think of some bad episodes worth fixing I forgot, feel free to mention them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and hopefully I might see you next time. Stop blurring. You're making this very difficult. Ah! De-blur. Focus. You can do this. You got it. Ah, fear exposure. My damn favorite kind of therapy. <laughs> I'm afraid to say we had no member questions this week. So here's one from a few weeks ago. Lexi Lunapore asks, What laws do you have in Australia that don't exist in other countries? Well, we have some endangered animal laws. So we have a lot of road warning signs for animals like koalas and kangaroos. Fun fact, koalas can actually be quite aggressive and territorial. So in the outback, we try not to get too close to them unless they're injured and need help. 